Hi guys, welcome. I have another monthly wrap up for you today. I've not done one of these videos since May. Last month just didn't happen, okay? So we have an accumulation of two months worth of books to go over, 15 books to be exact. Did I stick to my TBR? The summer TBR was very promising and I fully intended to adhere to it, but then I went back to my apartment and I said, audio summer TBR, see you in a week. And I read six books while I was there. None of which were on my TBR, mind you. How does one read six books in a week? I don't know. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that myself. All right, I'm gonna try to not make these reviews too long as we have a lot to go over and I would hate for your dinner to get cold. Let's get right into it. Starting with my lowest rated book, The Club by Ellery Lloyd, I gave two and a half stars. I listened to this book on audio after saying that it wasn't getting the best reviews, so I wasn't really sure if I actually wanted to read it, but one word kept reeling me in rich people drama. So I had to read it, or at the very least, listen to it, and hope that what the girlies have been saying wasn't true. Newsflash it was. I wanted to be the odd one out. I wanted to enjoy it so bad, but sadly, no. At the beginning of this book, we know that someone has died at the infamous elite club known as Home over their three-day launch weekend. Home only admits the most A-list celebrities. I'm talking about Beyonce, Kardashian level of fame here. So the media is all over this disaster. We don't know who has died, but over the book as we follow the alternating POVs of the two owners, a PA, a membership curator, whatever that means, and a maid, we see what led this weekend to turn deadly. My main issue with this book is is that we get little crumbs of celebrity drama that we scramble to eat up. But the entree, the main event, is mostly just these bland, uninteresting POVs we follow that really don't relate to the club. And it's like, not to sound mean, but why are we focusing so much on the people who run the club when there's a whole club of celebrities right in front of us doing nefarious activities that would have been much more interesting to read about? Also, too many POVs. I couldn't keep them straight. And I wasn't sure if this was just a me thing since I did listen to it audibly, but others on Goodreads said the same thing as well, and I was like, like, amen. There are so many more gripping thrillers out there, so this one can be a skip. Something Wilder by Christina Lauren. I gave three stars. Half of the time while reading this, I quite enjoyed it. The story was cute, the plot was fun, but the other half of the time, I was checking to see how much longer of the side left. I couldn't connect to the relationship we follow, and on top of that, I didn't really enjoy any of the characters. Except Bradley. He was one of our male MC's friends. He single-handedly carried this whole book, honestly. The ultimate cinnamon roll character. I want a whole book now centered around Bradley. And after putting up with this, <laughs> he deserves his own story. The humor in the little adventure the characters went on was enjoyable though, but I felt like this book was trying to give National Treasure vibes and it didn't. Although I enjoyed the adventure aspect, it needed to be longer and there needed to be more high staked scenes. And I understand this is a rom-com, so nothing too crazy is going to happen, but the rom-com part is what held it back. The best part of this book wasn't even the rom-com. <laughs> the Nesting by CJ Cook was my most unexpected three star of the month. I say that because this was dripping with turn of the key energy. There's a secluded creepy house, a new nanny, creepy children, all very reminiscent of turn of the key. Except this didn't do those tropes justice. This was more so a dragged out Ruth Ware wannabe. This book is set in Norway, which I did like, but that doesn't mean I want a third of the book to be purely nature descriptions. I wish I could have boop fast forward through all that. There was way too much fluff. The ending was short. If you couldn't imagine a story arc, the resolution would have almost been non-existent. You're probably now like, wow, Sarah, it sounds like you didn't like this book. Well, that's the funny part. I kind of actually did. When you are not getting bombarded with how pretty the fjord is in the morning, what's going on with the house they're building or Norwegian folk tales, the thriller aspect was pretty solid. Not as great as in Turn of the Key, but it kept me reading. Killjoy by Holly Jackson was my 3.5 of the month. This is a novella that takes place prior to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, although I would not recommend reading this prior because I know if I did, I wouldn't have picked up the rest of the trilogy, which would have been a shame. This book is for diehard fans of that series that just want to hang out with the characters more and understand that this is definitely not going to be the best book in the series. There's not much you can do in 100 pages. <laughs> but I will say it was kind of interesting being in the mindset of Pip before everything happened because her character changed so much over those three books. So I could see some elements of future Pip in this Pip, but just not fully developed yet. Is this a must read? No, but is it a somewhat fun time to spend a empty Saturday afternoon? Sure. Hooked by Emily McIntyre. I gave four stars. I think I described this before as a Peter Pan retelling. My bad, this is not that. But rather a romance with Peter Pan references that ends with the villain getting the girl. In this universe, Wendy is the Nepo baby of Peter Pan. 
who is courted by Hook, the ringleader of this underground drug trade. And though Hook is definitely a villain type character, one, he is not the ultimate villain. You'll have to read the book to understand what I mean by that. But there's something else going on in here that interferes with Hook's business and his and Wendy's relationship. And two, he still has morals. Like for example, the way he treated Wendy's brother was so sweet. Like he didn't need to do that, but he did out of the goodness of his heart. Whatever ounce of goodness he has in his heart. I did see the twist coming. I have a thriller reader brain. I've been wired to pick up on these hints scattered throughout the book, but it wasn't annoying per se. It was actually satisfying that I was right. I think because that was just like a side plot, it wasn't like the main storyline. This is a dark romance, so yeah, there is some questionable stuff happening in here. That's not going to be everyone's forte. I, however, was like, this is ridiculous. I love it. And I wouldn't really say that this gets too dark. So if you want to dip your toes into that genre, this would be a good one to start with. I'm not in like a big rush to continue that series, but I'm certainly not opposed, especially since I know the next book has like Scar the Lion King references. Don't know how one turns a bunch of talking animals running around the safari into a romance, but do I want to find out? Yeah, kind of. The 22 Murders of Madison May by Max Berry. Although this is a science fiction, I would say it reads more like a science fiction thriller. The science fiction aspect being the concept of the multiverse and the thriller aspect being our MC Felicity who is hunting this guy who keeps jumping universes and offing the same woman in each. And that is why I think this book really worked for me. It wasn't too futuristic science-y. And y'all know anything butterfly effects related has me frothing at the mouth. So of course, one of my favorite parts of this book was was seeing the characters differing lives in the each parallel universe. The author fantastically gets readers to emphasize with the characters. You root for our MC Felicity, you connect to and then kind of mourn each iteration of Madison and you loathe our villain or at least his actions. However, I have finally realized through reading this book that I don't like journalists and literature. Now publishing and the whole publishing industry, that's another story. But I've read one too many novels with journalists and that combined with the fact that I don't even read the newspaper leads me to just get bored with it all. And it's the same thing in every book. There's always a journalist who is trying to get a story, which yeah, is what journalists do. Authors, I just, let's just take a break from the journalism trope. I am just so tired of it. But overall, this was a fun, unique read that provided a change of pace for my usual books. Everything I Know About Love is Dolly Alderton's memoir that explores the trial and tribulations of your 20s. Whether that's dating, finding a job, navigating friendship, this book is an accumulation of anecdotes from Alderton's past and observations slash life lesson she took away from her 20s and early 30s. I really enjoyed how this book emphasized the importance of all forms of love and how love can be found in more unexpected places and not just in traditional romantic relationships. One thing that really stuck out to me was how Dolly Alderton discussed coming to accept the mundanity of life and how life can be mundane, but it's a blissful mundane, which is in itself a privilege in a way that I feel can be overlooked. I personally love some of the mundanity of life. Grocery shopping? Fun. Reorganizing? Sign me up. Somehow Dolly Alderton combined passages that discussed more deeper issues such as addiction and mental health with other passages that were more lighthearted, that had recipes and lists and somehow made it work. And I just have to applaud her for that. Me, I could never. I loved seeing the friendships in here. There was also a lot of feminist energy, which was stunning to see. It felt like I read this next book months ago, but no, it was just last month. The Girl in 6E by A.R. Torre. When you go into this book, you should know that all you're gonna get out of it is ridiculous entertainment, which you know, has its time and place. The whole premise of our protagonist living as a shut-in in her apartment to avoid killing people is insane. But then again, she did lock herself in, so she does have a conscience, which was actually an important aspect of this book because as you get to know Dina, you start to realize that she is a good person. She just has some very dangerous issues. <laughs> Reading about how Dina went about her life and the obstacles she faces day to day living in isolation, oh man, <laughs> brought back some flashbacks. <laughs> and this book was written in 2013, so living that way is a lot harder to do than it would be nowadays. This was fast paced, it kept me hooked. Apparently this is a series. I haven't seen the later books in store, so I'll probably end up ordering them online, but I can confirm I will be continuing. Final Girls by Riley Sager is an example of a slasher written specifically for Sarah. 
Not every slasher I can get behind, but since the story was more so a psychological thriller that focused on the characters and their psyche instead of the actual event that resulted in these final girls, it made the overall story more compelling. It was so interesting being in the perspective of someone who had experienced something so horrendous and still years later is dealing with the guilt of being the only one to live through it. Throughout the book, we get glimpses into the night that changed our protagonist, Quincy's life. So we are not only trying to figure out what happened that night, but we are also trying to figure out these three final girls that the book is centered around. In the beginning, Quincy has this perfect facade of a life she subconsciously puts on to avoid dealing with the past, which same, if anyone uses avoidance as a coping mechanism, it's me. But over the book, as Quincy has to confront her past, we start to see the real Quincy, who may not be as perfect as she seems. Slowly, I've been working my way through Riley Sager's backlist, but I haven't been disappointed yet, which has been very promising. The new Riley Sager looks really good. What's it called? The, the only one left? I know it's set at like this gothic mansion on a cliff that is slowly crumbling into the water below those vibes. Another book that has great atmospheric vibes is The Thriller of the Summer, The Last Word by Taylor Adams, which I gave 4.25 stars. I said this a couple videos ago, but this thriller takes place during a rainstorm. I read it during a rainstorm. There's literally no better way I could have read this book. I'm just gonna come out and say it. This was better than No Exit. There was more depth in here that I felt was absent in No Exit, but if you did like No Exit, I think you will also enjoy this book because both are fast paced and have arguably tend to make twists, which I don't want in every thriller because the plot can get kind of lost, but every once in a while it's okay. Half the time, whenever something happened that I was guessing would happen, immediately afterwards something completely unexpected would happen. So this is definitely one that keeps you on your toes. One of my favorite tropes is included in here where the POVs contradict each other in a really humorous way. That's like a very niche thing, <laughs> but those who get it, get it. This is a book whose witty writing had me grinning ear to ear while reading. In my opinion, this book is worth the hype. It was really fun time. Had to change my camera battery, but that gave me an opportunity to reapply my lip gloss, so thank you, camera. Nora Goes Off Script by Annabelle Monahan. This is a rom-com that is very domestic, which I view as a good thing. I really enjoyed all of the cute family relations. I just self-inserted myself into their little family, just chilling, eating my imaginary popcorn. In this novel, we follow our girl Nora, a screenwriter who, after her divorce, turns her marriage collapse into the best screenplay of her life. Of course, the script is picked up by a major studio, and before Nora can fully process what is going on. Her house is getting swamped with filming crew and famous celebrities such as Leo Vance. But after filming wraps, everyone leaves, except for Leo, who offers Nora a proposition of $1,000 a day if he can stay at her house while he gets his life back together, works through some stuff. I read this book cover to cover and I'm still not really sure why this man couldn't just go to a hotel or rent another house so we didn't disrupt this little family. Also, sometimes rom-coms can do this thing where they make the male love interest almost too perfect, that it veers into unrealistic territory. And that is kind of how I felt towards Leo. We didn't really get to know him, but I guess I can ignore that because this man, I've never seen a male love interest as interested in interior design as Leo. And honestly, that's a man after my own heart. Again, loved the strong family aspect in here. My biggest critique, everyone say it with me, the third act breakup. It's centered around miscommunication and not even in a realistic way. Like I could not imagine this playing out in real life, especially for the length of time this went on for. But in a book, an author can do whatever they want with the characters, especially something this improbable. The reasoning behind it was just all too silly, even for a rom-com. But I did love the characters and the overall cozy story. Also, Nora is a romance screenplay writer, which was all very fun and kind of meta. I'd recommend if you're in the mood for a sweet, cozy, familial rom-com. I'm not cut out for two month wrap-ups. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. I gave four and a half stars. Oh man, <laughs> this book goes into a lot. We've got addiction, masculinity, race, chronic illness, motherhood, all wrapped up into a romance. Excuse me, the talent dripping from this novel, babe, is incredible incredible. These characters have so much depth and emotion. I could feel these characters' emotions as if they were my own. However, if you don't like pop culture references, stay away from this book. But what is it with people being against pop culture references? Like, I just don't understand. So what if you can tell a book was written 10 years ago? What's wrong with that? It's part of the reading experience, getting immersed into that specific point in time. Look, if they're done well, I honestly find them funny. That's my hot take for today, but I digress. This was overall a beautiful, heartfelt, second chance summary romance. You're not supposed to die tonight by 
Kaylin Barron. If you're looking for a fun, campy YA slasher, my friends, look no further. Our protagonist, Charity, basically runs this summer camp horror attraction, and I loved how she is in charge of everything. Oh, did I mention? Charity is a teenager, but, uh, She's got it covered. But I love how she chose which guest survived the night. If a guest pissed her off, she would be like, Kyle, mark guest one to get off in the first act. I mean, everything is fake, but people literally pay to spend a horror-filled night at this camp. But obviously, real gruesome things start happening and craziness ensues. I read this during Summerween, but this would make a great Halloween read because all the vibes are there. I thought it was about time to pick up another Ellen Hildebrand. She is an author who is always on rotation for me, so I picked up Golden Girl. This one definitely felt different from Ellen Hildebrand's other novels because we literally get a POV from someone who has ascended, which was very different, but refreshing. Ellen Hildebrand really went, Huh, which POV can I add to my novel that I haven't already done before? <gasps> the Afterlife. I'm almost like positive that Ellen Hildebrand used this book as a way to write a better self. Vivi, one of the characters we follow, is a well-known author who lives on Nantucket. Ellen Hildebrand is a well-known author who lives on Nantucket. Come on, the, uh, the similarities couldn't be more obvious. Also, Vivi writes a book called Golden Girl. So let me break it down for you. Ellen Hildebrand wrote a book, this book, Golden Girl, about an author who writes a book called Golden Girl. <laughs> yeah, I myself was confused as well. It took me a hot minute to figure out that that's what was going on in here. Of course, this novel has that classic Ellen Hildebrand deep character development that we all know and love. I always have fun looking for in her novels all the ways in which she references her previous work, and I probably even miss a bunch because this woman has written more novels than I will ever get to. And then the last book I have here to talk about today, thank God, <laughs> is The Swap by Robin Harding, which I gave 4.75 stars. This thriller basically follows three distinct female characters who fall into this toxic friendship with boundaries that are a little blurry. This is especially evident after two of the women swap husbands for a night, hence the swap. Guys, this book is a classic example of why we give authors a second chance. I picked up The Party by Robin Harding last year, thought it was mediocre. The characters were very unlikable, which in that book didn't really work for me. And I didn't just not like them due to the fact that they were written to be unlikable because in this book, the unlikable characters I really enjoyed. Especially Lo, she was such an intriguing teenager and I couldn't quite figure her out, but that is partially why I liked her so much. These characters, I felt like you could root for, even though you didn't like them, <laughs> which you couldn't really do in the party. But I was addicted to this book. I read it so fast. I'm so glad Kenya picked up this book during her summer ween readathon because she kind of reminded me that, oh, I have this book. Maybe, maybe I should read it. And now I want to read more Robin Hardings. This was so close to being a five star, but the ending was kind of lackluster. However, the ride was so fun. The journey is arguably more important than the destination anyways. This is a big stack of books. <laughs> Excuse me, we're having some technical difficulties. Clean up on set, clean up on set. Here are my June and July reads. If you have read any of these books, let me know your thoughts on them. Also, in every wrap up, let me know your favorite book from this past month. Keep those book recs coming. That was a bit of a long one today. Maybe it won't be once I edit it down, but we'll see. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. It really does help me mention out a lot. You can also comment, interact, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff. I'd really appreciate it. I'm wishing you all the best for your reading in August. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will see you in my next one. Bye. Thank you.